Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so excited we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspirational show coming right up. So our guest today is Nancy Rines, and she's here today to talk to us about her book, Awakenings from the Light, 12 Life Lessons from a Near-Death Experience. So many of Nancy's friends call her the atheist who went to heaven, and Nancy is known as the leading voice for personalizing the wisdom of near-death experiences, developing our heart center intuition, and living a life of inspired creativity. So let's welcome to the show, Nancy. Hi, Marianne. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. I'm so glad that we're going to be spending this time here again. Um, Gosh, it's been a few years since last time we were able to do this. Right. Yeah, I think I think we we were one of your first interviews, if not the first. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there was a lot of uh, bumbling around on that one. I can remember that well. (laughs) On on my part too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, everyone has to start somewhere, right? You know, so. What a, what a, I can imagine a better person to spend that time with. And, you know, and for our listeners, and I've, you know, learned about your journey and been following you, gosh, for quite some time, you know, and so for those that are new to your story, and, you know, why don't you share a little bit about just how this story began for you? All right. Well, it, um, it's, I'll start really before the the good part um mm-hmm. before my nde i was a science writer in the boulder colorado area and i had gotten my degree as a geologist from uh, northern illinois university and then went on to study graduate my graduate work in colorado so i was really steeped in the sciences and i during that time, I became, you know, when I was in school, I became a pretty staunch atheist, although maybe perhaps not the best one because there was a part of me that really wanted to believe in something grander and um, more spiritual than, than, you know, just this physical life that we have. But I was such a scientist that if I couldn't, like, physically touch it and measure it with my ruler... It didn't exist. So for most of my adult life, you know, 20 plus odd years after school, I I would really consider myself an atheist. And about, well, four years ago now, it was so it was in the fall of 2013. I was in a kind of a funky place. And, you know, I was thinking that my I needed a career change or something. I was just kind of not feeling happy with my life. I wasn't terribly unhappy, but but I wasn't the happiest person in the world either. And I just thought that meant like a career change or I was going to move or something or I needed to move. And it turned out that that was a little bit of a premonition in um late in the later month, later part of December of that year, I was really starting to get some really wacky dreams. And for me, wacky dreams are like seeing butterflies all over the place or having this sense that uh, in my dreams that something huge was going to be happening to me. And it turned out it did <laughs> pretty quickly after that. Yeah. On uh, January 3rd of 2014, I was riding my bicycle in the uh, Boulder general area of Boulder, Colorado, and got uh, hit by a woman who was texting while she was driving an SUV. And I was on my bike, and she basically T-boned me, which meant she hit me from the side, ran over me, and was dragging me under her vehicle for quite a while. It was. And it was. She didn't. She didn't even realize that she had hit you. She was so no. she engrossed in <laughs> texting. She was. Yeah. She. She didn't even look up. <laughs> my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I actually had a moment where I was looking in her front windshield at her while she was texting, and she didn't even glance at me. She was so busy with her phone. Wow. So, um, yeah, so she ended up continuing to drive, and I ended up being uh, dragged under her vehicle. for The, the, the um, police officer said at least 50 feet. It may have been 
longer than that. For me, it felt like forever. <laughs> oh, I'm sure because you're you're and for our audience to kind of get a, an understanding of this, you are under her vehicle, basically holding on, you know, because she's going through one of those roundabouts, and if you let go, you're going to get run over. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I was luckily for me completely conscious through the whole thing. I never lost consciousness at all. Um, and which, you know, my book, I described that that caused me a little bit of PTSD later, but mm-hmm. it really saved my life because I was able to hang on. And, and plus, I also got a part of my um, sternum got caught on her car, on her vehicle. Uh, so there, I was hanging on and then a part of my uh, body, sternum got yeah. caught as well. So I wasn't going anywhere <laughs> until oh she gosh. stopped. But luckily, one of the people that was behind her came around the roundabout and stopped her, you know, kept her from continuing to drive. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I had angels on the scene. I had a woman kind of appear out of nowhere who kept me from getting up and moving. And if she she hadn't done that, I would certainly have been at least a paraplegic, if not a quadriplegic. Um, because my my neck and back were really badly broken. I, I think it was nine different vertebrae that were broken and meant multiple places each, and my neck was in really bad shape. But my one one vertebrae in my lower back was completely shattered, and um, so I was brought into the trauma center after all that. And they determined I had a lot of broken bones and a a lot of breaks in those broken bones. Um, It it included, you know, ribs and a collarbone and a pelvis Mm -hmm. and sternum and, you know, neck and back vertebrae. So I was brought in, I was uh, scheduled for surgery a few days later because they needed to repair my back. It was just in such bad shape that they didn't think that I would be able uh, to really have full mobility again if I didn't go in and have my back completely fused from the middle of my back down. Uh, So they put in, they were going to put in titanium rods to stabilize and fuse my lower back. Mm -hmm. So I was okay with that, but I was also terrified because I had been in surgery before and while I didn't really have anything happen during those surgeries, it basically, you know, you, you you go blank for a couple of hours and then you wake up and everything's all done. But this time I was really scared. I was scared of not waking up. I had, I just had this feeling that this was a huge, a huge deal for me, not just because of what they were going to be doing with my back, but there was, I, it just felt like something else was going to happen. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I basically flatlined for a couple of minutes on the operating table due to an issue with the anesthesia. And we're they're still not really sure exactly why I reacted the way that I did to the anesthesia, but it doesn't really matter. I did. Um, I. I died on the operating table for a few minutes, but I didn't know that. I, when, you know, they, in, they injected me with the anesthesia and I kind of drifted off. And the next thing I knew, I was waking up in this beautiful place. And I thought, wait a minute, this isn't what I remember <laughs> from other <laughs> surgeries. <laughs> it's like, I don't think this is the waiting room or the, you know, the recovery room. <laughs> Not the recovery room I remember. This is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And, you know, once I got, I processed the visuals, I realized there was something else. There was love and peace that was coming through me as if it was ele- almost like electricity. Like if you were, were to, to touch, I don't know, a, a, put your finger in a light socket or something. It's not quite that intense, but... But, you know, you have electricity flow through you when you touch an open circuit. That's the way this felt like. It felt like love was coming through me and almost lifting me or holding me in an embrace. 
And it was so profound and so beautiful and so peaceful that I started crying. And I thought, well, this is an okay place to spend surgery. (laughs) I'm okay with this. (laughs) And, And then I had this thought that, huh, I wonder if I died because it was just so different from my prior surgeries. There was an immediate thought like, I wonder if I died on the operating table. And then the next thought I had was, now, wait a minute, if I died, what am I doing here? Because I don't believe in any of this stuff. <laughs> and you're probably going, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> what am I doing in heaven, right? I'm not yeah. supposed to exist. <laughs> None of this is supposed to even be here, but it's pretty good. <laughs> pretty convincing. And um, I had... A voice, and it wasn't a voice I heard with my ears, it was a voice I heard with the core of my being. And this voice told me, This is your home. You are a part of me. You are my child. Welcome home. And that's all it said. And it was with that that I just spent what seemed like forever crying because I felt like I knew it. It, I knew I was home. There wasn't a belief. It was a knowing that this was our true home, my true home, that I was like finally done with that life on earth. And here I was back where I belonged. And it was so beautiful and peaceful to, to be at one with that presence. And I thought, well, this is cool. I can, I can go on and, See my family now, the one you know, my family who have passed over, and and that really wasn't what happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, and at any point when you're sitting here, kind of realizing, okay, I, I I think I died on the operating table. I'm on the other side. You know, are they going to come and kick me out? I mean, how is this going to work? Well, and that's what I expected because you know when I was I was raised as a Roman Catholic, and so I thought well, shoot, I'm supposed to be in hell. Mm-hmm. Are they going to escort me to hell now at some point? Because that's what what I was taught, that if yeah. you don't believe in God, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, I was raised the same way, so I get it. It's kind of like there, there's not a whole lot of, there's no gray area. It's, either, it's very black and white. It's like you do this and you go in, you do this, you don't. Right. Yeah, exactly. And there wasn't a St. Peter that I dealt with, but um, I was, I I guess there was a part of me that was really expecting hell. And then within moments, I don't know how many moments, it just didn't, time didn't really matter. It wasn't, there was no concept of that. Um, I was approached by a female figure, a woman kind of with long brownish hair, and she was wearing some kind of flowy, silvery, glowing uh, garments. I, I don't really know what to call it. It was not really a dress. It was more like a loose pantsuit or something. But, mm-hmm. you know, she, she introduced herself as um, a spiritual guide who was going to show me heaven and, and teach me what I needed to know in order to come back to my life on earth and have a good life and I immediately stopped her and said I I'm not going back (laughs) (laughs) well and this this being that you met this isn't anyone that um that you know of like a aunt you know aunt Lucy or uncle Joe or anybody like that that you have met on this plane this is a, a a new um kind of a guide for you that was making themselves known Right. I hadn't seen her before. I didn't know her from this current life that I'm in, although I will say that I had the feeling of familiarity. So I felt like I had met her at some point before this life, and I couldn't really grasp that concept at that point. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, now I know that, that she and I have had dealings before in another you know, in the spiritual plane before I came into my life. So I knew her then, you know, before I was born, 
But from this life, no, she wasn't someone who had been in my life here and then and then died and gone over. Um, to me, she was completely new at that point. Well, and I and the reason I ask that because I think a lot of times people, you know, they will kind of naturally expect if they're greeted by anybody in heaven or you know the other side, it's it's somebody that they have known, and this is a new individual that's coming to you, a new being right. with new it was really information on what you're going to do next, right? Right. Yeah, and it's it's not. And I've spoken to a lot of other people who have had these experiences in the time since, and Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's maybe 50-50 or so where people are greeted by someone they know versus someone they don't. So it isn't always, you're not, you don't necessarily have to be greeted by someone from this life. Oftentimes, you're greeted initially by someone who is, some kind of a spiritual being. It might, you know, some people might be greeted by Jesus or the Buddha or a saint or some other exalted teacher or just a spiritual being whose job it is to greet people. It's kind of like the Walmart greeter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh-huh. Well, and then in your in your case, she was very specific, and she told you you would be going back, and I know you fought that. I did. The whole time I was there, I fought it tooth <laughs> and nail. Um, I mean, who wants to come back to this? It seems very mundane to be here after having mm-hmm. been in that spiritual existence for so long. And and I'll, when I say that, I want people to understand, for me, it, it all of the teaching that she gave me, and all of the learning that I did with her, all of the places that we visited, if I were to equate it to what it would take here on earth to accomplish that, it would be somewhere between two and three months or maybe a little bit more. So for me, it felt like I was getting two or three months worth of personal instruction, you know, 24-7 personal instruction. So it was a lot of stuff, and I was immersed in that in that plane of existence in heaven, if you will, for months. So coming back here was the last thing I wanted to do because I was so used to being in that beautiful, loving, supportive space with all of these wonderful beings who were helping and loving. I didn't want to come back here and have to deal with mundane human existence like, you know, having to cook your meals and wash your laundry and, you know, do the dishes. All that stuff felt really mundane to me after having been there for so long. So I I just played along with it for a while. As, you know, she introduced herself and said she was going to teach me. I just said, yeah, I'm not going to go back, but I'll listen to what you have to say because... You know, I want to continue on to be with my family who have died. And so, you know, obviously I have stuff to learn. So I went and, and I, I humored her. And <laughs> that was my, in my mind. I'm going to humor <laughs> you and learn what you have to t- teach me. So it was, a, it was a profound amount of teaching. It was a lot. It was a lot of it had to do with how to live our lives here in a more loving and beautiful way and harmonious way, but also in a more successful way. And by success, I mean how to accomplish what it was that I came here to do. Not necessarily, you know, making tons of money, but, or having a high position in a, you know, Fortune 100 company, but really how how to come here and be the person I was meant to be. A lot of the teaching had to do with that, but a good chunk of it also had to do with just basic spiritual principles that form the core teachings of heaven or, you know, the other side. Um, what you know, Some of the core teachings were the importance of divine love and what divine love really was is or is. It's the structure of all. It's the glue that holds everything together, not only in that spiritual realm, but also here as well. 
and the 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 depth and breadth of that is astounding. I'm only really beginning to learn the the depth of that love and what it means for us here as I continue, um, you know, since my NDE. But she talked about that. She talked about, you know, she went into many, many teachings about gratitude because gratitude is really just another form of love and it's a very beautiful, selfless form of love when you can step back and and honor the good that came from someone else or even something else and 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 the impact it may have had in your life so it's in just another form of love and all of that all of those loving things that we do love is a verb it's not just a feeling but it's also a verb the loving things that we do and say help enhance the love around us in a very real sense so she gave me a lot of teachings like that um i also went through a life review which i didn't realize it was a life review at the time it just Mm -hmm. seemed like it was another teaching but it turned out that was my life review it wasn't necessarily an easy one for me to to deal with um that was you when you went through that, was that something you realized was happening at the time, or did that kind of come up much later? Well, I realized it, what, what, I realized what was going on, but I didn't have the the term life review associated with the teaching. I just thought it was another teaching. And um, what basically what happened is is she walked me through this mountain this valley in the mountains and the valley was filled with big beautiful trees and we came upon a pond a little small pond it may have been at most 100 feet across it was really tiny and the pond had really dark water almost like the the black water in the in the deep south where where the rivers run with um tannic tannins and tannic acid and they turn this really dark tea color well this this particular pond had a very dark surface like it was you know colored by tea and she had me reach down and touch the surface of it and see what would happen once I touched the surface and I I was kind of being a smart aleck and I said well I know what's going to happen I'm going to form ripples on the surface. And she just said, just do it. (laughs) (laughs) Just listen to me, you know. Yeah, Uh, she's like, stop being difficult, just touch it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, it's because your scientific mind is still in play. Right. I wasn't completely dead yet. So I was sort of between life and, you know, physical human life and that spiritual life. So there was a part of me that was still that human being um, who was the scientist. And um, so I touched the surface, and obviously there were ripples that formed from where I touched. but, But then the magic happened. And on top of those ripples, I started to see like little tiny movies all across the surface of the pond. And each one of those little movies, I was watching how different actions that I had taken in my life affected other people. So it was maybe, you know, 50 or 60 different movies that were playing out on top of this pond. And in one of them, I may have inadvertently said something to hurt someone. And not only did I see myself hurting that person, but then I was also able to feel what that person felt when what I did or said hurt them. So I got to feel their hurt. And that was a huge eye opener. I got to see my and feel my actions from the standpoint of someone else. Mm -hmm. And that was startling. And I felt, honestly, I felt really ashamed at some of the things that I had done and said, even though they weren't hugely bad. I mean, it was typical human drama and human stuff but it still felt somewhat shameful to me to be in front of you know 
this beautiful spiritual being and, and frankly, you know, God or, or the whole heavenly realm realizing what a doofus I had been for, you know, saying that nasty thing to that person. And uh, luckily that was balanced out with times when what I did or said really helped someone. So I then got to see times where I might have been, in fact, there was one time when I was in a grocery store in my hometown in Colorado, and I had, I had said something to a cashier who, she was really frazzled, I think it was a holiday, and she was really frazzled and just tired of dealing with person after person. It was just a busy day. So I said something really nice and uplifting to her, and it made her feel really good inside. And I got to feel that from her perspective. So I was a, it was a big teaching moment for me, deep empathy, not just empathy, but I was able to feel what those other people felt when I interacted with them. In Again, a positive way, yeah. In a positive way. And it was a huge teaching moment. But that is the essence of the life review. What I've heard from other people, it's very similar to that. I, you, you oftentimes see your life projected on what looks like a movie screen. For me, it happened to be a pond, but, you know, it's the same idea. But we're allowed to see how our actions and words impact other people so that we can make that change when we come back and and understand that what we do and say truly does have an impact on the world around us, even if we don't think it, it does. It does. <laughs> Trust me. I'm very <laughs> conscious of that these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, and especially when you come back with a perspective like that, when you've you know, been able to see how actions really affect other people, go both good and bad, even small ones. You know, it it's not something I think people need to be afraid of, but more aware of, like, hey, you know, when you're doing something, you know, always try to look at doing it from your best and highest good because of the impact that it has. Right. Yeah, there shouldn't be any fear. I'm a, I'm asking people to understand there's there 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 really doesn't need to be any fear involved in that. It, it is like you said, more of an awareness thing. And you know, if you screw up, which we all do, it's okay. You can apologize. That's what apologies are for. Um, and and understand that you know, just do the best you can. And and that's what's expected of us really is just to do the best we can. Not to be perfect. There's a difference there. We're not expected to be perfection. We're expected just to do the best that we can. And that's it. Yeah. And and move forward. So, right. you know, you came back. You know, you, you had the NDE. You learned a lot from the, your guide. And this guide's still with you, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. She still helps me out because <laughs> I still need it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Right? Right. Oh my goodness! So with with all that going on, so when you got back, what are some of the things that you experienced? Because I know you had to go through, you know, a deal, you know, quite a deal of recovery, but not as much as most people would have thought. And mo- not as much as as the doctors expected either, and that it was a surprise to I think the. Well, it's certainly a surprise to my trauma team that I recovered so quickly. Mm-hmm. And and certainly to my orthopedic surgeon. I physically, my recovery was very fast. I was able to be, they had me in a, in a one of those clamshell back braces uh-huh. for about five weeks. It was actually just shy of five weeks that the doctor's, decided you can have this off now you don't need it anymore and you can take your bet your neck brace off too which Which they weren't (laughs) for what you want to do they they didn't expect that to come off for 12 to 16 weeks so i was out in five (laughs) wow maybe i was out for good behavior i don't know (laughs) Well, obviously, they're like, okay, you've got a mission to do, so getting your body healed as quickly as possible is is important. And that's, you know, it's not unusual for people who have had near-death experiences to heal very quickly. And, in fact, 
um, Anita Morjani, who had an a bit, you know profound NDE as a result of basically dying from cancer, came back and was cancer free very very quickly. One of the most remarkable cancer recoveries probably ever documented. So it's not unusual for that to happen with people who have had an NDE. Uh, it still surprised me. I didn't know a lot of this stuff at the time, so it was still surprising. But but the thing that t- took longer for me was really coming into, well, allowing what had happened to transform me. It was terrifying for me at first to go from atheist scientist to holy cow, I think I just met God. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden there's a lot, I mean, it just is a whole new awareness because there's something to believe in. Yeah, and guess what? I have to make some changes because I I agreed to do some things when I came back, like clean up my life and live a better life and, uh, you know, accomplish some of the things that I had come here to do. In order to do that, I knew that I needed to really embrace the experience completely. And that wasn't, and it, and it continues to unfold even three and a half years later. But it's more than just saying, yeah, I had an NDE. It's been for me three and a half years of um, exploring what that means and truly living it. So learning how to um, do different prayer practices every day so that I can get myself in a place of peace every morning, learning how to take that NDE experience itself and bring it into my life in such a way that it transforms me from, you know, this anxious almost depressed person I was before into somebody who's completely at peace with everything that ever happens and is joyful and loving and um, caring, which Mm -hmm. I wasn't demonstrative about any of that stuff before. But now I was given the chance to allow heaven to really, or, you know, that divine wisdom that came to me through my guide to really work its magic and transform me into someone who can go about daily life in a very spiritual way. In fact, one of my students about a year ago when I was in San Francisco said to me, he said, um, wow, you're beyond the point of having a spiritual practice every day, he said. He said, your life is your spiritual practice, isn't it? And I said, that's a really good way to put it. And that's kind of how I feel now is instead of having a spiritual practice in my life every day, my life is my spiritual practice. So there's a little bit of a distinction there. Um, It's Mm -hmm. been for me learning that I can, I can walk in divine light and divine wisdom in every moment and still be here living my life but not attached to all of the drama and angst and negative stuff that we often experience here so it's the it's the living in this world but not being of it that is spoken about in the bible i think i'm starting to kind of grasp what that is it's I think for a lot of people that and I hate to interrupt you here for a quick minute, but I think for a lot of people they don't really even understand what that means. So coming right. from a place where you can and you can explain it to this degree, I think helps a lot of people understand what it means because walking your life should be a spiritual practice. Everything we right. do should be a spiritual practice, but it it can be one of joy, not not one of you know, of obligation. Right. And it's it's really amazing because one, once I made that transition where I would, and, and I understand now what it means to be fully present in each moment. I get it now because it's, mm-hmm. it's for me, 
it's I call this is the way I term I term it. Before I was living with my ego at the forefront of my life. And the ego is that fear filled human, you know, chatty voice that, you know, wants to keep us doing all of the same blasted things that we were always doing because it's afraid of whatever. It's afraid of of making a a choice that could be from the heart rather than from the mind. Um, The ego is concerned about looking good to other people. The ego is concerned about making money or being important or that type of thing. But where, where I feel like I am now, or at least I'm getting there, is where I'm living more from the standpoint of my soul is leading and the ego is off to the side or even behind me. I, I'm leading my life from a soul perspective where the soul is in front rather than where the ego is in front, where I was before. And what that means for me is that I'm more thoughtful in each present moment. I'm more concerned about how my actions and words impact others, what I can do in each moment to to help other people or to be loving or what. Mm-hmm. And and it doesn't it sound it might sound um, like a I don't know ponderous or or a lot of work, but it isn't. It's it's natural now. It's that's just who I am. I just live that way. Well, it's, it, I and think, it, you know, you don't have to have a near-death experience to live that way. It's just setting into practice new ways of of just living life and being. Right. And you don't have to have an NDE to be this way. It, it does take some practice, though. It does, it, for most of us, it isn't. It isn't an uh, an immediate thing. And even with me, I would say it took me, you know, after my NDE, it probably took me almost three years to get here where I am now. So it, it did take some work. And that was three years of pretty intensive, not not a lot of time, but, but just consistent practice of um, prayer. For me, it was prayer. For other people, it's meditation. Mm-hmm. Um, doing some intentions in the morning, you know, a lot of other things, a p- gratitude practice. And I, I did some things like uh, walking, what I call walking prayer. Other people might call walking meditation, but, but being more, um, more aware of each moment and, and how my life is in that moment and taking those opportunities to have intent in each moment, not just going and being reactive or kind of going into that ego space of unconsciousness or um, auto. I call it autopilot. That's kind of the easiest way for people to understand. So instead of being on autopilot, I, I try to be conscious of what I'm doing in each moment. And, um, it's a lot easier these days, but but it's much more peaceful and gives me the opportunity to really understand how how I can positively affect those around me, even if it's in a small way. You know, it can just be really, truly, deeply listening to someone when they have an issue or a problem, personal issue, personal problem. It doesn't matter, but just being attentive and loving with that attention. I think sometimes that's the best thing that we can do is being present and being able to just be there and, you know, and and fully listen to what the the person that we're communicating is saying as opposed to getting, like, you know, stuck in the ego in some ways and then they'll, you know, thinking about, okay, well, what do I need to do next and how about money or, you know, there's always something that will take the mind down um, its own road. Right. Yeah, if you're list, like trying to listen to a friend, who, maybe your friend is having a marital issue or a relationship issue and he or she needs you to really be there and listen. But if you're making your grocery list in the back of your mind and wondering when you can get that moment to, you know, text to your other friend or, you know, you're wondering what, what you're going to say at your presentation at work tomorrow, that's not being present. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and I used not to at be all. that way. 
Um, so you're right. It, people really appreciate focusing in on them, especially when that person is having a challenge, you know, in that moment. So it's it's less about it's it's kind of like being of service. It's a way for you to be of service to that person just by being there. You don't necessarily need to solve everyone's problem. But sometimes just really listening and and paying attention and maybe holding their hand or um, giving them a hug in a heartfelt way is is all they need. Yeah. What is now? I know that you came back with some just amazing messages. But before we get on to that, I think it bears, I mean, I do want to bring up that your doctor actually talked about your NDE with a local paper in uh, Boulder, Correct. Colorado. Can you share a little bit about that for us? Sure. My uh, my physician, Dr. Christopher Trojanovich, who works out of Boulder, Colorado, he was my physician who coordinated my care after my uh, accident and NDE. I, I he was he's really really a great guy and I I was a little bit afraid at first to tell him what had happened during surgery. I you know I had worked with physicians in the past and I knew them to be very very much like me as I was before. You know they were scientists and so they most of them that I dealt with were very concrete. So it took me months to come forward to him after my NDE and say, you know what, this real, this happened to me, can you shed some light on it? And I remember going in there to his office, I was nervous as heck because I knew I was going to talk to him about it that one day that I went in for that checkup. Mm-hmm. And I, my, I, my stomach was just a knots, I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> I kind of thought he would tell me I was nuts, you know. Yeah, and I'm like, I don't remember that at all because, you know, for the medical community to talk about this, it's a big thing. It is, and they're not, uh, well, they may experience it in their patients, you know, from uh, they may see their patients having these things. They're not really at liberty to talk about it very often, or it, some for some physicians it makes them uncomfortable because it's outside the boundaries of their science. Mm-hmm. So, and that's what I expected here. And the first, after I told him what had happened, the first words out of his mouth, I kid you not, were, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's and pretty so cool. I did, it is. And I, you know, I didn't, we didn't really talk about it a lot after that. And it's been a couple of years, but this, this summer, a reporter from the Boulder Daily Camera up in Colorado Boulder, Colorado, had called me up, and she wanted to do a a story about me and my experience. And just at the last moment during that, when the time she was interviewing me, she said, well, do you mind if I speak with your doctor? And I said, sure. I honestly didn't Mm -hmm. think that that he would talk, quite frankly. Yeah, talk to them at all, yeah. Yeah, or, or make a statement that would be printed in the newspaper. I didn't expect that, um... In fact, it's it's almost unheard of for a physician to come out in public and basically verify somebody's near-death experience. And she called me up the next day and she said, I got some great quotes from him. He's okay with me putting it in the paper. And I think my jaw hit the floor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think, I think a lot of people would feel that way because, you know, again, you know, with science, most people who deal in that realm usually stick with things they can quantify. Right. And and he was okay with saying, you know, the only thing I can come up with that, that had happened to her was a true near-death experience. It looked like it was a true near-death experience to me. Mm-hmm. And it felt so validating and and I I know he and I talked about it personally but to have him come out in public in the paper put his name to it and say yes this was a real near death experience it was I mean I think I was on cloud 9 for days after that it was incredible to have that level of verification 
And I'm still very grateful to him uh, for coming out in public and saying that. It was amazing to me. So, but it's not normal. It's not, I wish it was more normal. It's not usual for physicians to do that. And a lot of them would like to. I will tell you that a lot of them would like to be able to say that, but they feel constricted by the boundaries of their practice. So I get it, but I'm so glad that he was able to feel comfortable enough to say, yep, this is what happened, and and I agree it was an NDE. Well, and, and, you know, he could have very easily, you know, not have taken the interview or calls or anything, but he felt compelled to, which, you know, and I see this with your story that people are attracted to it because of the energy that it brings. And it's not just, you know, when people go through NDEs, it's a, it's a very traumatic experience, but you came back with, you know, some profound messages for people to really take to heart. And that's, uh, originally I came back and I thought it was going to be just messages for me and my family. Mm-hmm you know, to help improve my own life because, you know, goodness knows that I needed some help. (laughs) But (laughs) we all do (laughs) now. And and I, once I started sharing it with my friends initially, I started to see how they were starting to use what I said or what I brought back in their own lives and make changes. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. So, I started sharing it a little more widely and more widely, just gradually as I felt comfortable. But it is, it's, it's, it's information that isn't just for me. It's, it's for everybody who is, who wants to hear it. And, and I don't, I don't mean to shove it down anybody's throat. That's not at all it. It's more like Mm -hmm. if it's here, if you want to listen to it, if not, that's cool too. I don't really. Yeah. Care. If it resonates yeah. with you, hey, great. If not, you know, don't. I, you know, it, it's interesting because I kind of, I, mean, I know we kind of subscribe to the same uh, philosophy. It's really if it resonates with you, you know, listen to what really inspires you. But if it doesn't, like throw it over your shoulder and keep going. You know, that's right. It, it, yeah, it's okay. I don't. I'm not at all offended. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> you know. People gravitate toward the type of information that that will best work with them, and that's okay. And you know, some of the things that that I was taught and told really seem to help people, and that's great. I'm it's awesome. I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, some simple things like you know, one of one of my spiritual team recently said I was angsting, you know, six or eight months ago about. A lot of people do this about what my purpose is in life, you know, and and I had recently gone through some um, uh, inner inner turmoil about my art. And I had been a painter before and I I felt like earlier this year that somehow my art needed to change, but I didn't know what it needed to look like. And and I was all, you know, I started to get into the human drama thing and. You know, he piped in and he said, just chill out, number one. Number two, what are your interests and passions? Do them more. That's Ooh. it. That's all he told me. I was like, that, that's it? Really? <laughs> it's like, that's all you've got for me? But that's pretty profound because a lot of times people do things that they're not necessarily, you know, when um, when I first started in business, it was in insurance, and I would speak with hundreds of employees. I'd have to do presentations, and I, you know, studied happiness for a while, and I was always curious. And I'd ask people when I'd meet with them, you know, do you do you like what you do? And most people would say, No, I hate my work. I hate the work I do, and that's a sad place to be in. It is. And I, when he said that to me, I realized that the art that I had been painting before this time, so up until January of this current year, mm-hmm. um, I, I wasn't really, truly all that interested in it anymore. I was painting it for other people, 
not because it was coming from my heart. Yeah. And once I realized that, I took a break for a while, a long, a long while. There was a, there was another story that goes with this, but mm-hmm. but I ended up taking a break from my my old uh, subject matter to see what was bubbling to the surface and what was bubbling to the surface that I really, really desperately wanted to paint in my heart was more spiritually themed paintings. And, you know, I had originally, after my NDE, thought about doing spiritually themed paintings, but in my ego mind, I thought, nobody's ever going to like this stuff, so I'm not going to paint it. <laughs> You're like this isn't happening. I'm I'm just gonna forget it. <laughs> yeah. No. Who's gonna like spiritually themed paintings, right? So mm-hmm. I just put it aside until the point at which I could no longer put it aside, and it came back and hit me upside the head and said, "This is what what really is coming through for you right now is in your heart of hearts. You want to paint spiritually themed paintings." So. Yeah, I switched over to doing that only recently in the last couple of months. So, mm-hmm. but I feel better doing them. But just that one, those two little lines, what are your interests and passions? Do them more. You know, it's, it's little stuff like that. They're the, the team that I, that I work with, my, I call them my spiritual team. They're, they tend to be quite to the point. They're not very verbose. Um, no. <laughs> things like um, for those people who don't have a lot of money like you know if their bank account is feeling a little bit dry but you really do want to help other people out by giving you know we're always told that we, we should donate money or tithe T-I-T-H-E mm-hmm. so we tithe money to our church or something and one of the messages that came came um from my team was tithe or give with your service for a change rather than your money. Hmm. So instead of worrying about giving of money, a lot of organizations or churches or, um, you know, nonprofits, they could actually use volunteers. So take some time out of your week, a couple hours a week and just volunteer. And, and that counts just as much as giving money does. It's like, wow, I hadn't thought of that before. <laughs> well, and, and I, I think even more so, especially when we look at situations, and I know these are kind of extreme situations, but we, when we look at what's happening in Texas and how people are rising to the occasion to help other people and, and what they're giving, you know, the local people there – they're giving so much, but mostly what they're giving is their support and time and being able to go out and help other people within their community. And right. I think that means so much more. And when people look at tithing as not being just money, you know, it, it can be more like, as you're saying, it, you know, it, it's your time. Right. Yeah, it can be. It could be reaching out and being of service and instead of you know, we don't have to think of it as just cash. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and in fact, honestly, it feels better for me to reach out and help someone in person than to write a check. And I know I know organizations need money. I get that, and I'd still donate. But but at the same time, for me, I feel as if I am doing more when I actually am there helping someone. So, and that counts. Basically, what they're saying is, don't worry, that counts. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so, you know, through this whole process, you know, I know you've gotten so many messages and you, you continue to get them. I'm part of your community. I, I'm i actually getting your newsletters and um, inspiration that comes out. What are some of the surprising things that has, you know, that you've discovered during all of this? Uh, just how much I think that I'm still supported every moment of every day. That's, that's one of them. I had, I had one of those little angelic interventions just a few weeks ago when I was least expecting it. 
and and so it's still a surprise when that stuff happens like wow you guys are still here you're still with me you're still <laughs> intervening they didn't bail <laughs> they didn't bail <laughs> Um, oh my! And, and you know, another surprising thing I think for me has been just how amazing it has, how big of a difference it has made in my life to learn to truly let go and not attach to things or concepts or ideas. So uh, mm-hmm. what I mean by that is, um, I. I've learned the hard way that if I get too attached to a specific outcome that I want to have happen, what that does for me anyway is it brings in the potential to have a lot of fear along with not getting that outcome that I want so desperately. That makes sense. And Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't realize up until even just six months ago how attached I was to some of those particular outcomes that I really wanted. And when I say attached, I mean like closed fisted, hanging out with both hands. <laughs> I was <gonna> <laughs> <it out. laughs> I, I get that, you know, because there are times you're like, really? Are they really thinking that they must have the wrong person because I like this stuff. This is mine still. <laughs> you know? Exactly. And, you know, my... One of the main teachings that my guide, her name is Mary, by the way. Don't get too, too attached to what that name means. It's just Mary. But um, when when she was with me in, in the spiritual realm during my NDE, one of the main teachings that I had there with her was learning how to let go and allow God to work in your life. And I, I honestly, I didn't get that message until maybe I didn't really understand or fully embrace that message until about six months ago and then once I did it was like a light bulb went off like wow this is great (laughs) like hey I got this (laughs) (laughs) you guys handle it and it's funny that once I started letting you know the divine and and my spiritual team handle a lot of that stuff Wow, my life got way easier. Things started flowing. I didn't have any stress. It was wonderful how how much that changed my life for the better. I'm like, wow, I couldn't have learned that lesson three and a half years ago. Darn it. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, really? Come on now. You know, why did that just make itself easily known? Right. But, you know, we have to learn. And, and some for some of us, like me, it takes us a while to build up to fully understanding a lesson like that. Yeah. And, and just how I'm to sure it's still it. unfolding as you go, too, mm-hmm. because, you know, I, it's like when you learn something, and, and I would suspect this is especially true with what you're going through, a lot of times it just unfolds layer after layer after layer. It's not just one lesson. Yeah. It's like it's a compounding effect. It's yeah, it is. It's like a spiral. You know, you go through it and you learn some stuff and then once you learn that, then you realize there's a whole another layer that I need to learn about this and then you dive mm-hmm. into it a little bit more and and you realize, "Oh yeah, there's there's a little bit more I can do here." And or it's made apparent to you that you need to learn a little bit more. And, you know, sometimes it isn't, for me, it, it isn't necessarily my choice that I'm going out and seeking the learning. It's just very apparent that I need to learn more about something specific, like letting go. Like, I'm not really quite there yet because this other <laughs> thing just came up and yeah. oh, I'm still attached to that outcome. Um but it's that that particular lesson I didn't realize how powerful that would be and it surprised me just how powerful that is in my life um I suspect well, it is for a lot of people well and, and especially I mean because of the messages that you continue to get I would suspect that you know with each one Um, Because it almost feels like in some ways that you channel some of the messages that you get, some of the insights. Is that kind of true? Um, Or is it like a knowing? 
It's it's something a little bit different. I mean, sometimes they're annoying. I mean, sometimes it's mm-hmm. an absolute knowing. I've got the words right there as I, you know, come out of a meditation or a prayer and it's, boom, it's right there. A lot of the times it's really part of a, a a practice that I go into every couple of days. And it really, I don't call it really a meditation or, excuse me, a channeling because I'm not giving up my power or consciousness to some other being i'm mm-hmm. communicating i call it a, a chat i'm chatting um so what i do is i go into some might call it a meditative state uh it's for me it's something really a combination of meditation and prayer and during that time you know once i reach the state i want to be in then i begin to ask um, questions of my spiritual team because at that point i've raised up what I what I come to realize is I've raised up my vibration to a, a specific level where I can then be almost back in my NDE state again. So I'm almost back in heaven, and I can communicate almost as easily as I did during that time with my team. So it really, truly is more of a conversation rather than a channeling because I don't give up my own power. I don't, yeah, I don't let someone else speak through me typically. That doesn't resonate with me, but it is more of a conversation. And uh, it's very surprising. (laughs) Yeah. Now, with with the, um, because I mean, I find that completely fascinating especially the part where you're able to bring yourself to that vibration where you're in that place that that feels like heaven, you know, that's on the other side. Is that something that anybody can do? I mean, we don't, I don't think, um, it, maybe it's um, something that's a byproduct of having the NDE, but although we are not saying that people need to have NDEs to be more spiritual, but um, is that something that anyone can learn to do with their vibration? I've been teaching people how to do it, so I would say quality. Would a yes, then. <laughs> with, yeah, with a yes. In fact, I've got a a workshop coming up in San Francisco in in on September 16th where I'm teaching people how to do it. But I've I've taught this uh, several several different times, like in full day workshops. Mm-hmm. And it does take some practice. I'm not going to say that you're going to be able to have a full-blown conversation out of the gates. You might, but but I can teach it. And if you're if people are very open and receptive and if they have a little bit of talent, they can have some kind of a conversation. Now that doesn't mean your conversation will be like mine. You might have a sense of a knowing Rather than, like me, I go through more of a verbal conversation because I tend to be more, uh, one of my gifts is I'm clairaudient, I guess is the mm-hmm. term for it. So I hear um, clarity from the other side rather than see it. Like people, some people are, they see visuals. I don't see, I don't see that stuff, but I'm able to hear that conversation and I also get a sense of knowing sometimes but you might have more of of a knowing conversation where you you know you can from your heart you can converse with some other being and then you can feel that coming into your being the answer back Um, and, and some people might have a conversation you know via signs or uh things happening in the in the world around them so instead of again a verbal conversation they might get some really clear specific signals of in their in the world around them what's what is trying to be uh what is trying to come through that's not as i think not as easy to uh deal with because it can be kind of obtuse i I try to teach people to do the verbal and the knowing rather than uh, just, you know, kind of signs in the environment around them. 
but but I've had pretty good success. I think in the first the first hour that I did the last class, it was probably a good 40% of the people in the class were able to have a conversation. And that's pretty darn good for the first first time out. It took me several months to be able to get to that level when I started doing it. So uh, it does yeah. take some practice, but but it is teachable. Well, and all that's such a journey, you know, it's, It's not, I mean, maybe it could be for some people overnight, but I know just through my spiritual experience, like having those kind of connections and being able to, um, to grow those and expand those, it just is something that takes practice and time. Mm -hmm. And again, for me, it was letting go, letting go of the idea that this is crazy. This shouldn't be happening to me. What is this? You know, the science, when the scientist would raise its hand and say, hey, yeah, that's not real. <laughs> <laughs> we can't quantify that, so that's going to go into this box over here that we don't deal with. You know? Right. Yeah. But, well, and, but I'm I sure it's kind of this. You know, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say once I started getting, like, evidence that this was real, then, then the floodgates kind of opened. And I understood just how powerful and true it was, you know, when I would connect with a being who told me certain things about his life on earth and then I would check in with the family and sure enough it was true. Like, wow, okay, I couldn't make that stuff up. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Well, in um, I think we just have a few minutes here. What final thoughts would you like to leave us with? I mean, because I mean, this journey is so profound. Every time I open up one of your newsletters, and I, I'm just really blown away with the information that's in there. So, what final thoughts do you want to leave us with today? Well, the first thing is the one the one piece that. You know, every, everybody out there needs to know is you are loved beyond all measure in each and every moment. So, you, you know, we're all equally part of the divine family, each one of us, and we're all equal members of that, and we're all loved, and we're all supported, even if we don't think we are. Just, you know, I know it's hard to just know that you are, but no, I'll tell you, you are. You're loved in each and every moment. And and kind of along with that is the the request that my my guide Mary gave me was to remember to treat each person as if he or she were God or a or um, another spiritual being. Even if they're not very godlike in that moment, because each each soul does harbor a, a spark or a part of the divine presence, and that's really really powerful. Each one of you out there, even if you may feel like right now that you don't love yourself, you are loved beyond all measure because there is a part of of the divine in you, and you are a part of the divine. So. You know, you're worthy of your own love, and you're worthy of the love of other people. So just remember that. I think that's an important message, and um, what a beautiful way to conclude our show for today. I mean, thank you, Nancy. I I really appreciate um, you spending the time with us, and not only that, but just being able to share these tremendous insights. I mean... I, I really just appreciate all the time you're spending with us, and I understand you have quite a few events coming up this week. You're going to be um, I do. <laughs> kind of really busy in the Bay Area. Right. Yeah, I'm doing a couple of days of camping in the Redwoods, and, and then after that I've got four different speaking engagements in um, the San Francisco area. They're all listed out on my website. The first one's in Berkeley, on September 13th, which is a Wednesday, uh, it's in the evening, and then the next one is in, I need to look on my 
my what on my or website it's uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> um, it's in it's in the South Bay area. It's I believe it's in Saratoga. It's at St Andrew's Episcopal Church, and again that'll be in the evening on on Thursday the fourteenth, and then on the fifteenth I'll be speaking up in at Unity Church in Marin. Uh, and that's again at 7:30 in the evening on Friday, and then Saturday I'll be at the Sunrise Center in Corte Madera doing the full day communication workshop. Um, I think they call it the Angel Whisperer Workshop, which I like that title. But um, I'll be doing the full day workshop in Corte Madera on the 16th. Now, if someone wants to work with you to deepen, you know, to raise a vibration and deepen that connection with their spirit team and guides and what have you, where would they be able to, do they just contact you directly on the website? Yeah, that's the best way to contact me. So just go to my website, which is nancyrines.com. That's N-A-N-C-Y-R-Y-N-E-S.com. And there's information on the website about how to do that, how to contact me. And then they can reach out to you from there. So, oh. Right. Oh, and real quick before we go, um, so you've got two books out. And so um, why don't you share a little bit, because I know one, Awakenings from the Light, We that was actually – um, one of our first shows was on that book, and you have a new book that's out. The, yes, the next book is called Messages from Heaven, and it's really just a book of of dif- these different messages for you to use in your prayer or contemplative practice or your meditation practice. You can, you know, read one and, and think about how that in, impacts your life or make it a part of your life. So it's Really, the information from my spiritual team for you in a format that's easy to understand and and contemplate. Mm. And then book three is in the works, so I'm I'm excited to be continuing on that. That's taken a little bit of a of a left turn or a right turn, I should say, and I had to change <laughs> up things a little bit, but uh, but it's good. And that one will be called Touched by Heaven, and that will be out. I hope next year. Yay. <laughs> and then where is the website that people can connect with you and be part of your community? Um, so you can start, you can go to my own website, nancyryans.com, and then on that first page that you go on to my website, there's a sign-up list. So you can sign up to, for my email list. And what that does is it signs you up for a newsletter I send out it depends on how how much time I've got available to do them. You, I try to do one a week, but it might be every other week. And then they could also connect with with me on social media, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. And then I've also got a blog that is linked uh, to my website. So I also do blogging that you can uh, up at the top part of my website. There's a link to go to my blog. And so you can sign up for the blog there as well. And I, again, I update that one uh, every couple of weeks and come out with, you know, new information or tips or techniques that I've learned or things that have happened in my life and um, that you might be able to bring into your own life. So it's not all about me. It's really about teaching you what I'm learning at the same time I'm learning it. Well, I've enjoyed reading your blog, The Spirit Way. I get that in my inbox when you've got a new one, and I'm part of your community. I love getting your, you know, your newsletters and seeing all the great things that you're doing. And gosh, this workshop that you're doing, you know, where you're teaching people to raise their vibration, I'm over, I'm all over that like white on rice. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so we will be talking about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, you know, Nancy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Mary. It's really been a pleasure. It's been fun. Yes, I'm so glad we were able to catch up and hear more about your, you know, all the great things that you're doing. And for everyone tuning in, you've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count.
In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information. Thank you.